the first question, what's working? What isn't working? What are the big picture structural issues? Uh, what, are the what kind of relationships do you have with broadcasters, for instance? And uh, are, there, are you happy or unhappy with those relationships? Uh, and eventually, we, of course, want to get around to what the uh, CRTC might do to uh, change or modify those relationships. <coughs> so, is there somebody that would like to start off? I'm Anne-Marie Parada. I'm the Counselor for Quebec for the Writers Guild of Canada mm -hmm. and a screenwriter and story editor. And the way it works for me, especially writing in children's television, is that, you know, Teletoon has, they can only buy so much. They have to produce, they have their budget, they have to produce Canadian programming and Treehouse and all the others. So because they have to, I get work. Otherwise, they would just go on their shopping spree to LA and they just buy up everything that's uh, doing well over there. So um, I'm able to work because we have these uh, expenditure requirements. And uh, I want to see that happen more. But, but if, you, if those expenditure requirements didn't exist, you could move to Los Angeles and maybe get more work. Uh, wouldn't that be better? You know what? Uh, it's funny because uh, the Writers Guild of Canada has better um, minimums and so on. Uh, and in LA, it's a uh, free for all for uh, children's writers. Uh, but um, it's not necessarily that I can go down there and work. I want to live here, I want to raise my family here, and um, I want to be able to tell Canadian stories. And that's why we stay here, I, I believe. Like the writers who I meet, uh, I'm going to council this week, and everyone I see, you know, the reason we stay here, the reason we all haven't picked up and gone to LA is we want to be here, and we, we don't want to be pushed out. Erwin Cox, Quebec English Language Production Council. So I, I apologize. Uh, just when I, when I hear people say uh, things like, what's the CRTC do and why do we need it and why do we need Canadian television? I sometimes get a little excited. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and suppress my excitement. <laughs> Janice Lundman with Back Alley Film Productions and um, co-chair of the Quebec English Production Council. Um, I, when you say that the CRTC helps to create the demand for Canadian programming, I think that's incorrect because I think the demand is there in the audience, and that demand has been building over the last 20, 25 years. Canadians love watching Canadian television, whether it's you know drama from Da Vinci to you know Bomb Girls to you know Heartland to Republic of Doyle, whether it's documentaries, children's programming. The audience is there, but I think what's hap what the CRTC does is they provide regulations for the people who want to ignore that and simply go out and make more money and more money. Um, or want to build their companies and don't really care about Canadian culture or about um, what it is that we are trying to say as you know Canadians and as content providers. I think you're perfectly uh, right and I uh, accept uh, your correction and I should have said that they in fact what they do is channel the demand for Canadian programming. I think that's what the, I think it would yeah. be fair to say uh, and perhaps you would agree that in fact what they do is channel uh, the, the demand among Canadians for Canadian programming and ensure that Canadian broadcasters are responding to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Okay, anybody else? What's working for you and what isn't? <coughs> Mark Schechter, a writer producer, um, First Star International. Um, agreed to the perceptions and the observations of others. Um, I think, in terms of um, what would work better, um, is to really feed the R&D part of the business and development. What happens is that uh, the amount of money allocated or by conditions of license um, mandated to support the development, piloting, scripting, packaging of production is very low in ratio to what, they, what it should be because from a producer point of view, if the money was there, more in abundance, you'll often hear from broadcasters saying, we only can commission three or four things because we've, we've maxed out. Mm -hmm. The condition of license should be such that some of that profit should be gone in not just production, but the R&D, i.e. development, and then the producer whose responsibility is to finance gets out of the handouts think and gets out into the international market with a package that has been financed and works with the broadcaster as a partner to be able to finance the balance of production. 
where the shortfall comes in is that there's very little money, even through the agencies as well, to subsidize that part of it, which is unique to Canada and could really stimulate production on a broad scale. The U.S. networks, and I've worked there internationally, will supply a tremendous amount of capital to develop properties and have the choice up here that that gateway is extremely narrow. So I think we have an emphasis on production and production financing and envelopes. We are very short on the, the R&D on the development side of new properties through the Kojikos and all those who do provide certain programs. When you look at the numbers and the amount actually provided there, it's very small in ratio to the production dollars. There's been a pilot <coughs> system in the United States, has there not, for some time? where production of pilots is a part of R&D. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't really have pilots, as I understand it. Uh, perhaps you can correct me, but as I understand it, there aren't very many pilots that are produced in Canada. In my experience, little, because if you have that fortune to be able to move that quickly, they'll order it right to series. They won't mm -hmm. spend the money on a pilot necessarily, because that's expensive. Uh, they used to once upon a time test these out, in my experience. Mm -hmm. But again, I come back to with the role of the producer. I think a producer can be much more proactive. That's a whole other discussion. But I think it's a partnership in this partnership, not legally, but in a sense of working together to provide the quality of programming through a choice of production that would increase the watchability, give choice to the Canadian audience of good stories well told. Um, um, but the, uh, when you look at the numbers of development monies throughout the whole system, it's a fraction. Uh, the theory being that they have to finance production, but the producers can get out there and actually start working with the broadcasters, try to find, mm -hmm. finance these productions. So that's a solution that I offer that I find works for our company and I suspect would work for others as well. I totally agree in terms of research and development and uh, you know, being able to have some cash flow that you can option properties, that you can pay for writers, that you're working with the network, you know, does this work? You, know, you go through the outline, the script stage. The pilots were tested out in Canada, and they're, sort of, they're not being done that much anymore because they are so expensive, and it takes, you know, a lot of energy and time and money to do a pilot. I mean, in the States, they're not doing that many pilots anymore either. You know, you'll start with 500 ideas, you get to 100 scripts, you get to, you know, 50 pilots, and you end up choosing five shows. And we just don't have that kind of resource up here. Right. The issue of uh, international co-productions was briefly touched on. Is that, uh, is that a solution? Is that a way out? To, um, is in, in, the fi in the big financing picture, certainly there's money offshore. Um, is that a potential solution to the problem of financing Canadian programs? Please, there are two here. Uh, hi, my name is Edward Fuller, actor, student. Um, I'm not fully familiar with the, the whole scene, but I just know of a few co-productions that have been out there, like the Borgias and the Game of Thrones. Uh, I don't know if the Game of Thrones was co-produced with Canada, but I know the Borgias was. And, but that was not actually shot here in Canada. So though they had Canadian performers, it wasn't filmed here in Canada. So I don't know if that would be very helpful to the production community at large here in the country. Somebody else, yes? Um, hi, I'm Lily, I'm actress, and I worked uh, as a producer as well. I actually did a co-production with China. And um, you get into a cultural thing that's really sometimes hard to sell cross-border. I mean, something might work here, well, won't work internationally, let's say. And whoever pitching the bigger percentage of the financing have a bigger say. So in the end, what is Canadian content at that point? Um, I also wanted to know, would it be maybe a possible model. I don't know if it's under CRTC's jurisdiction, but the ads that's shown on Canadian TV, maybe the Canadian content can get a tax credit if your ads is shown on the Canadian programming versus if your American show or whatever, CSI, your ads rate would be higher. So that's an incentive for the advertisers, but because in the end, the networks mm -hmm. have to make money. There might be a problem with, free, with the free trade agreement um, with that. 
But as a matter of fact, there is a tax credit currently that's been around since the 1970s for Canadian um, for Canadians of uh, advertisers that advertise on Canadian on 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 the Canadian system that U.S. Uh, and if they advertise in, in the United States, they're not eligible for that tax credit. So this was to prevent border, adver border stations. As you probably know, there are major border stations just outside of Montreal, just outside of Toronto and Buffalo, and just outside of Vancouver and Bellingham, Washington. And these stations basically uh, have large Canadian audi audiences, and they include PBS stations, by the way, mm -hmm. who uh, pitch to Canadian audiences. So in the 1970s, the Canadian government, this was not actually a CRTC issue because the CRTC does not have authority over the, the taxation system. But in the 1970s, the, um, the Canadian government um, uh, took away the tax credit that, that was being used up until that time by Canadian broadcasters who were advertising on, or uh, Canadian advertisers that were advertising in, on, on uh, US stations. Um, but I'm not sure that we can go much further than that. It exists now. Yes. I didn't know there were tax credits for commercials at yeah. all. He's referring to C58, yeah. which was that the Canadian broadcaster had a tax write-off uh, for showing American programming, and um, the, uh, the Canadian government got rid of that, and the, and the American broadcasters uh, had a huge battle about it, Buffalo and all of those uh, broadcasters, and they lost on the basis that what they were trying to do was double dip because the Canadian broadcasters were purchasing the Canadian rights for an American program like CSI back in those days, and yet they wanted to also uh, sort of take the Canadian uh, revenue from advertising uh, when they were uh, showing those programs. So anyway, now you're getting into simultaneous substitution issues. Uh, which is another factor in this today. So, sorry. All right, thank you. Yes, John. Yeah, I'd just like to get back to something. I'd like to reassure Mr. Cox that I have participated on, you know, directly or indirectly on briefs to the CRTC. I have some knowledge of what it does. I just don't know how far it can go. For instance, and there are two things I'd like to underline. One is, can they say we want X amount of um, uh, uh, Canadian literature on, on, on air? And I, I offer you one example that was, a, a, to my mind, a disaster. It was a, 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 a CTV was doing the right thing, and they were courageous. They were trying something new. And they did, Mar I think it was Margaret Deviner's uh, TV adaptation. You can't do that in 90 minutes without butchering it. You know, can the CRTC do anything about this sort of thing? to bring our, 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 our literature to the screen, because we do have these stories. Secondly, it seems to me that, w that we do have, um, and it probably comes back to the R&D uh, thing, we've had some great series on, on, on Canadian television. One, to my mind, was Nikita, which was terrific. There was Seeing Things, the Louis Del Grand. But then they disappear, and the question is, I think some research should be gone into why. Because, and I have to say, look, just go back, I don't want to talk too much either. Uh, I was working at Film Plan and back in 1979, Claude Heroux said, <clears throat> I applied for funding, I just wanted to pick, he was an uh, executive producer, I just wanted to go across Canada and doing what we're kind of doing today and just talk to people about what they want to see. And of course they wouldn't give him the money to do it, because that's the way it was at the time. And the, only, the last thing I want to, would like to bring up is, in Canada, we tend not to look at successful examples elsewhere. In Australia, and I lived there for four or five years, they have a special broadcasting service. It is a hole in the wall, but it has all the stuff that you want to see. And maybe we should divorce, although they have ma major networks in Australia that do what's, what CBC does, they have this other area where, you know, uh, you know, for a lot of people, it, it's, it's denigrated, but you, you, you could show Canadian films, you know. Uh, it, it's a, a, a have some special, like almost an HBO for Canada, that would showcase stuff. Because, you know, I, I go to the Montreal Film Festival, I read the catalog, and I say, hmm, this is good. I, unfortunately, I, I don't have time to go see it. I'll never get a chance. Where would it be shown? Well, maybe we have to go back and look at, at places where like Australia that has some fabulous innovative ideas and see how things are done. Yes, go ahead. 
Well, we have a lot of French production, of course, in Quebec, and you know, a number of networks filled with shows that are produced here in Quebec with Quebec performers. And I was, I've thought that maybe something like that could work on a regional or provincial basis. Maybe those kind of networks or groups of actors, producers, directors could be developed in every single province for, for viewing. I don't know if it could work just regionally because, of course, it's a linguistic issue here in Quebec, but maybe it could, that could develop interesting stories that everybody would want to watch across the, the country. Okay, maybe we should move into the second part of this discussion, which uh, in my mind concerns the future, uh, the present and the future. Uh, how do you see the system evolving over the next five to ten years? Uh, is there a threat to the existing Canadian system coming from over-the-top services, new media, uh, and uh, services such as Netflix? Is that, are they providing competition for the regulated system? These are, these are all unlicensed services. Um, whether they're actually broadcasting services or not is uh, an interesting issue, but they're certainly unlicensed, and as a result, they're not subject to Canadian content requirements. So are these unregulated or unlicensed services um, posing a problem for the Canadian system? Gary Sachs, a national organizer with ACTRA. I'm really glad you brought it up. Um, yeah, I'm quite fearful, actually, that, that in the last round, the CRTC did not uh, regulate the over-the-tops, Netflix, uh, systems like that. And that creates, in a lot, a lot of ways, an unfair competition. We will probably hear from broadcasters in the next round of license renewals, unless the over-the-tops are regulated, saying, this is unfair. Why should we pay into Canadian... Um, uh, production when Netflix gets away with it. In my house, I have a 13-year-old who, you know, just a couple of years ago was watching TV uh, when he wasn't doing his homework and we were regulating that within the house, of course. But uh, he hardly ever watches TV now. It's all online. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's a big problem. I, th I really believe that the... Um, uh, that uh, the CRTC should be regulating that. I'm paying, I, I get Netflix also, we pay $8. Part of that uh, should be going into, for example, the CMF. Uh, the other, the broadcasters, the regulated broadcasters have to contribute to that, have to contribute as conditions of license to the, uh, to the creation of um, uh, Canadian uh, production. And so should, uh, so should the over the tops. And it's, it's a problem right now in that the CMF is probably going to be shrinking over the years and we have to look for ways to, uh, uh, to bolster it and make sure that they do continue to, uh, uh, to fund uh, series like the ones that Janice has been uh, uh, working on to, um, uh, to hire writers and performers and uh, have um, you know, producers uh, get in the, uh, in, into the business. Uh, um, and in the long run, uh, this is going to, th without regulating the over-the-tops, there's going to be this huge wet blanket on, uh, on resources in our industry. And how would you go about uh, regulating these offshore entities, um, entities that are outside the country and have no physical, not necessarily any physical presence in Canada? Well, uh, you as the guy that wrote the book would probably have a better idea <laughs> uh, than I would. I don't know all the tools that are, that are available, but certainly these companies are getting money from Canadians. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's two sides. I, I know on, on Netflix there is a uh, Canadian production that you could go in and, and watch, and that's, that's good. Uh, that's good. But the money that they, uh, there should be some requirement if they're taking money out of the country to put it back in. I don't know if that's, or if it's uh, CRTC or not, but a tax, you know, a special tax on it might have problems with the uh, free trade, uh, uh, with NAFTA, I'm not sure. Uh, as you could tell, I don't know enough about, uh, about these areas, but I think they, there has to be some creative thought. I know that the CRTC has claimed they can regulate if they want. Uh, I'm assuming they can if they want, and I would be encouraging them to do so. Right. Um, in fact, what they did in 2010 was refer the question of regulating ISPs under the Broadcasting Act to the federal court. And the federal court told them that they could not do that, at least under the Broadcasting Act. So they can't pursue the objectives of the Broadcasting Act 
uh, by, and treat ISPs. Now, by ISPs, I mean internet service providers. Um, as far as I'm concerned, Netflix is not an internet service provider. It's an over-the-top service, so it's something distinct. But the ISPs are the ones that actually have a physical presence in Canada, and they were the first target, and the federal court decided that they were not broadcasting undertakings, and the Supreme Court uh, confirmed that opinion. So uh, we're left with a situation where these are something that, that are difficult to, uh, it's difficult to imagine a, a system that can capture somehow and treat these new services in the same way as the existing licensed services. Does anybody else have uh, some ideas on this? I think the trajectory is, if you just follow the money, is that the borders will vanish. Canadian culture, protected, will become passe in the sense of broadcasters themselves. And I've heard these discussions, and if you attend any conferences, you realize that they're very nervous about these over the top and everything. And in order to survive, they will begin to reduce and come to the CRTC and plead the case that they can't survive and that they have to stop these regulations and conditions of license to be so restrictive, which puts the emphasis now on the creators to get a new paradigm, to find a way to partner with or get into the same boat as everybody else because at the end of the day, the public is going to determine the like or dislike of a product and it's going to be much more of an open market. Um, if I look down the road, I realize that it really puts an emphasis, which is not the bad news, on ultimately the creators and finding a new relationship with broadcasters in this country. If they're going to keep the Canadian export business, it's going to become an export um, paradigm. And if they join forces and create product that they can show at home and participate in an upside so that there's a win-win for the creators and the broadcasters, they might find a formula then. But certainly with Netflix and other things coming in and unregulated, there is going to be a cry that we can't survive, we can't produce Canadian content, we can't get the advertising behind it. So that's the trajectory. I don't think that's rocket science to see that it's going there and it's being whittled away. What provides uh, Canadian content now in terms of its <coughs> rules and storytelling is going to become much more universal stories. That cry has been around for a long time saying good stories well told should be the criteria, not necessarily indigenous types of uh, representative representing the country but just good stories so I think that's really by looking you get on the side of business that's what it looks like in my in my observation and discussions with broadcasters Kerwin I, I noticed that when Americans make a TV program it's a good story internationally universally everyone wants to see it around the world when Canadians make a program set in Canada it's parochial and, and no one around the world, of course, will want to see it. Um, and I, there's an obvious double standard, which is my point, and that uh, I, I feel that everywhere in the world, people want to see themselves. And that's not unusual. That's normal. We're one of the few people, English Canadians, I emphasize, who don't seem to know they want to see themselves or seem to feel that's abnormal for economic reasons. And I remember arguing with people that ran broadcasting networks like CTV, for example, back in the 70s. And they said, Canadians don't want to see themselves. You know, you're, you're weird. Uh, and we know what they want to see because we're, you know, getting advertising statistics. We understand what they want to see. They want to see Hollywood programs. They don't want to see Canadian. Then in 19, I forget what it was, 1987, uh, Anne of Green Gables, the Sullivan, the Kevin Sullivan version of that, two-part series was shown on CBC, and it had over five million viewers on each part, most of anything ever on Canadian television. And all of a sudden, it seemed that it was possible to say that Canadians actually wanted to see themselves if it was good quality. That's the sine qua non. But if it's good quality, of course they want to see themselves. And what makes good quality? Well, one thing's money. You have to have money to have con a continuity of production, continuity of employment, so people don't get in, you know, do a job, and then wait five years for their next job. That's not a way to develop talent. And so um, I would simply say that I don't think that we're a nation of vampires who when we look in a mirror, we don't see ourselves. And I think that we're normal. 
and that therefore we should have a normal television system where we can see ourselves and not only produce <coughs> inter <coughs> international programming, which doesn't show us at all, which is set in Hungary or set in California or set anywhere uh, and doesn't want to say where it is. Uh, anyway, that's all my thoughts, so I don't want to say anything. All right, thank you. John. Yeah, I, I'd like to, uh, that's a very good point. I'd like to reiterate that by going back a little bit further to the National Film Board and its mandate to interpret Canadians to themselves and to the world. In post-war, the film, the film board is amazing. Every embassy throughout the world uh, was showing films, and everybody loved it. We were showing ourselves, and people could see it in Scandinavia, they could see it in the Arctic, and it was a fabulous program. And exactly, Mr. Cox has said, why don't we go back to this idea? And secondly, to answer this question of how I would see the industry in five years, frankly, having wasted so much time and frustration submitting projects, to the industry, I think the CRTC, if it can, has the power to do this, which goes back to my original question, look at a successful example of someone who treats producers and people who submit ideas with efficiency, respect, and, and kind of what you would call intelligence. And, and this is Channel 4 in Britain. It is amazing. You, if you are a producer, you get their catalog. They tell you everything about every single program. It sounds daunting. And, and, and at the very end, when I was doing this, Gub Neal, the head of it, was saying, we will simply never turn down a good story. You know? And everything was on track. And within eight weeks, you had acknowledgment. But then you had this and you had that. You, know, you spent endless times with, with these vice presidents of programming and, and all the rest of it. Why doesn't the CRTC tell these people, look at a successful example and set it up? Any other thoughts on, uh, particularly on, on over the top or new media, the impact of new media on, but please go ahead with whatever you have to well, say. Well, actually, kind of, okay, I'll tie the two together all right. uh, with what he said about looking at ourselves in media. Um, I use Netflix. I pretty much don't have TV. I get all my programming through Netflix and the internet, Facebook and YouTube and whatnot. So how often do I personally see Canadian content? Um, I don't judge. I, I look at the story and if it looks like a good story, it could be from Iran in another language for I can't I watch it. But if it looks mediocre, I'll flip through it. And I think that is the generation that, that's coming. And one other thing I noticed about Canadian television versus American, there are more ethnic representation in American TV than Canadians. A lot of Canadian programs are very, um, sorry to say this, whitewashed. I look at a program like that, I'll flip over. I'll watch something else. So, yeah. Um. And certainly this is a preoccupation with, uh, for the CRTC, uh, not only representation among the creative elements, but also on the screen. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to hear anybody else on, uh, on any of these themes? Just to agree, I think it's really important to see yourself uh, reflected and see stories that tell the stories that, that, that stem from your, your experience as well. So the type of regional reflection, and here in Montreal, I remember chatting with a few people, we're trying to think, what was the last show that was filmed in Montreal that, that was actually Montreal, for Montreal, as opposed to a nondescript uh, area? Uh, I'm gonna ask Janice, was Durham County actually <laughs> uh, set here? I know it was shot uh, uh, here. I'm not, uh, like that, that came up and we weren't quite sure. The, uh, the, the one that, that we were was a recent one, which was uh, Mohawk Girls, where it was actually located around here. Um, also, uh, with, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, it was a local. Beg your pardon. It will right. premiere January, February. Okay. So this is this is some uh, some good news uh, recently, uh, but it's been a long time. But the irony of nineteen two is it's a it's French a Quebec Asian. program, therefore it's okay to be set in Montreal done in an English version, and so therefore it accidentally is turning into a set in Montreal English production. Mm -hmm. But I think that you have to go back to 1990 in Robin Spry's uh, series, uh, which I can't remember the name of it. 
going up the streets, one of the sirens. 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 About the police. Yes. No, that was Buffalo, I think. Montreal is Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's it's hard. Uh, um, Gala Films series recently uh, was uh, made here, but not set here, so that tends to be the normal situation. Mm -hmm. Is what about the, 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 uh, the uh, challenge of new media, though? Well, how are you reacting to that as producers and as, uh, as creative people? Um, Christian and me from the IATSC Local 667, the International Cinematographers Guild. Um, it's very, your question is very interesting. By the way, I'm French Canadian based, so uh, sorry for my English. I, I hope I'm going to make no it problem. understandable. Uh, one of the issue, I think it's, you would agree with me, with TV production, it's all about money. And one of the questions that uh, is coming to my mind, uh, and I think it's probably the biggest issue of all TV producers, is how do we attract people to the network and how the network will get money back from uh, putting on the air our product. One of the uh, next step that TV will face, according to everything I read and everything I discuss with various stakeholders of the industry, is the interactive te television. I think it's the next step. I think we, we heard how uh, the new generation is watching TV. And don't forget, those watchers are playing video games and they are used to play with the story. And the next step to bring money to the, um, the broadcast, to me, is interactive TV. Okay. And that brings us to research and development. Mm -hmm. Is Canada ready to invest in R&D to bring the viewers to interactive TV? Right, but interactive TV can happen on game consoles and on the on uh, on um, computers and uh, mobile devices. Uh, to what extent can it happen on a traditional TV set? It could be easy. Yeah. You just need uh, another to to tool. You just need another tool. You have it with your TV, and your provider provide you with everything you need, and you interact. Um, this is uh, a thought I'd like to throw here, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's going to be the biggest challenge after color TV to me, <laughs> okay. because it's going to be very hard. There was a, a comment at the back here. Do you still yeah. want to say something? Well, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of younger viewers are definitely moving more towards computers instead of uh, television screens. and. There has to be some kind of a way to regulate that, or I don't know what happens to the broadcast industry in 10 years, what happens to the creation of TV shows. But that said, there are other opportunities that we don't have now that could come from services like Netflix. You turn on Netflix and you see a line of products right in front of you. One of the biggest issues that Canadian content creators have had is getting audiences to be aware of their shows and aware of their films. And it literally equalizes it by putting things side by side. Um, it undermines a little bit of the money advantage that the American programs have if you could set something up that would literally put them on par on a screen. But I think it's crucial to find some kind of a mechanism to, um, to regulate them because otherwise... And what do you mean by regulating them? Well, for instance, um, I was trying to get on the website for Urban Outfitters today because I wanted to buy something. I can't get on their website because it hasn't been translated into French and I'm in Quebec so I can't have it. So if things are coming over internet providers, there are ways, perhaps outside the broadcast laws, that could be used to, to deal with the situation. There is, I, I'm geo-blocked from watching Saturday Night Live. There, there are mechanisms that allow certain services to be shown or not shown. But you can watch it on, on TV. you can watch it on television on global. I can watch it on television on global, if I, but I can't watch it online. Right. Okay, there was another comment down here, I think. Yes. Um, so many. <laughs> yes. uh, so I'll back up a bit and totally agree in terms of the having trying to figure out some way to regulate the over-the-tops because they're coming, you know. And we've just went through this whole spate of license renewals. It's not going to be happening for another five or seven years, and by that time, 
you know, the revenue that's coming into the broadcasters is, I think, is going to be greatly reduced. Uh, I see that in everything, every every single year, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. I mean, they're, they're, it's like this tsunami that's coming, and there's no way ar around it. It's just going to be there because people do want to watch on their mobile devices. They do want to watch on their computers. Um, in terms of the interactive, the series, the drama series we just did for CTV played, we did an interactive component called Interference, where you can go, you watch the show on television, and during commercials, it's advertised to go on Interference. So you can go on Facebook, you can go on your phone, you can go on your computer, and you'll see little webisodes of what's happening with the characters. You interact, you're trying to help them. Um, you're trying to assist in the, it's a police procedure, so you're trying to assist with them. You have, you know, phone numbers, your phone number comes up on your, 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 your Facebook, you can phone in, people are interacting with you. Um, and I think, and it's done very well in terms of promoting the show and also it's just garnered us a new audience because as you said, that's sort of what they want to do. But how the CRTC deals with that, I'm, I'm not sure. What kind of regulations can they have uh, um, for people downloading, for example. If you look, uh, as a matter of interest, if you look at the CRTC monitoring reports and other sources of information, overall television revenue is not declining. Yeah. Overall advertising revenue to television is not declining. But there are major changes within the composition of those two things. The same with, tele with television viewing. Actually, television viewing, surprisingly, is remaining about constant. Um, but there are big changes in composition away from the generalist services toward away from the conventional services toward specialty and especially pay and pay-per-view and uh, video on demand which are mostly are licensed services if they're offered through your cable company or through um, through a satellite company then they're regulated services mm -hmm. so there, the changes are not happening all that quickly the other phenomena that, that we're seeing, of course, is Canadian content on, uh, on Netflix uh, increasingly. But Netflix is not, re is not a licensed service. And uh, that eventually could pose problems. It's putting pressure on the CRTC to relax the regulation on the licensed services. The licensed services are complaining and they're saying, look over there, they're not being regulated and we are. Um, and why should that be? We, we have these commitments, these obligations. Uh, why, why do we have to, well, why, the, this system is unfair. Mm -hmm. Sorry, was, that, was there a question, uh, an uh, issue here? It's okay. Okay, John? Yeah, just one last thing. I, again, it goes back to sort of what Mr. Cox was saying. I mean, I, I, can the CRTC say well, we should be paying less attention to what I would call derivative programming? I mean, it seems to me my, my entire life, was spent, we were trying to do Canadian films that sort of were, had the American feel, and that the CRTC should basically say, we're not gonna, we're gonna subsidize less cop shows, lawyer shows, all this, the, the, the traditional trademarks that, that Americans are so good at, and concentrate on other things. And again, I don't know if the CRTC has this kind of a, a purview, but I think if I were a screenwriter, I would love to go and be an intern on some of those uh, British series. I mean, how do they tweak these things and come up with, with all this particularization that is international in appeal? I think that the CRTC would be loath to try and give rules about this subject matter, that subject matter. But um, I think it's quite clear that as the world's environment and our television environment is getting more and more competitive, that the only way that we can maintain some share of it is improving the quality. And by improving the quality, I mean improving the popularity, uh, making things that people want to watch and, and that are competitive with American programming that, of course, will always have more money. So the question to me comes down to one of where do you get the money? And Netflix is probably generating right now about $200 million a year in Canada based on $8 a month. Um, and how much of that are they spending here? No one knows. Uh, and the CRTC claim that they have the power to be able to regulate Netflix and to be able to ask them uh, questions about how much they're spending. And I think the CRTC 
have to do that, at least to start by asking the Netflix and the over-the-tops how much they're spending and what, uh, what they're doing, and by doing that, asserting sovereignty over the over-the-tops, which uh, CRTC should be able to do. The other area that I think is really important in terms of money is the $1.3 billion that the broadcasters spend outside the country buying foreign programming. And I'm not suggesting in any way limiting the programming they buy, uh, but they don't have to spend so much of it because Canadian broadcasters spend more money on foreign programming than any other broadcasters in the world. So they go down to Los Angeles, they get locked into a hotel, they get drunk. Next thing you know, they're $1.3 billion lighter when they cross the border. And I don't see why we, uh, Canadians, should be paying so much money. And if there were maybe an excise tax, say 15 percent, that applied to all broadcasters, that would be $200 million out of that $1.3 billion. And if that money then went back to the broadcasters that lost it in the hallways in the uh, hotels of Los Angeles and said, okay, here's 50 million or here's $15 million that you lost in a gambling game down in Los Angeles, we're giving it back to you as long as you spend it on domestic production. And I talked to a few major BDUs and they all say, we'd love to do that. We'd love to have that extra money, but the Americans won't like it, so we can't do it. And so I would hope that the CRTC will regulate the system, not so much on the basis of, you know, people will be upset, but what's in the national interest. The other problem is you need the Canadian government to be involved in something like an excise tax, so I think we have to wait for the next election. <laughs> You've raised another issue for me, and that is, uh, to what extent, leaving Nets, Net Netflix aside, um, to what extent uh, are new media generating revenues for production of professionally produced programming? Um, it seems to me that they're generating very little and that basically what new media are doing in terms of long-form uh, drama uh, and many other categories, uh, docu documentaries, are recycling existing material that basically comes from the broadcasting system and that they're at the same time undermining the financing of that system to some extent, uh, and yet they're profiting from the recycling of that material. They're not producing a lot of long-form uh, drama documentaries uh, and other forms of, of uh, entertainment, um, leaving aside Netflix, which is a bit of a special case. So there, in some sense, new media can be thought of as, kill, as, the, as killing the, 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 the uh, the goose that lays the golden <coughs> eggs uh, in undermining the broadcasting system. Am I, am I wrong in that? Um, well, when we're talking about new media, are we con like counting Ubisoft and all the gaming? Because we have a really strong gaming industry in Montreal, and it's billions of dollars of worth of revenue. So are we counting mm -hmm. them? Are we not counting them? Because Grand Theft Auto, when they came out, I mean, it surpassed a billion in a few days in sale, so... Is there a, what is the Canadian cultural content in, in, the, the, in these games? Um, Ubisoft per se, I would say it's very, uh, not Canadian per se, but very multi-ethnic, multinational. It's generic, it's generic. Though. It's very generic, it, you can't even call it American or whatnot. Um, However, it does employ a lot of Canadians because mm -hmm. they're based here. So maybe we should focus a bit of energy, try to attract more of those co I mean, we are already attracting more of companies like that here. And I do consider them media. So. Uh, Grand Theft Auto, if I'm correct with the games, my son plays it and I see it, <laughs> but I don't play myself. I think it does have Canadian content, at least one of the Ubisoft games. It turns out that you're actually in the imagination of these people who are creating the game, working in an office, mm -hmm. who are speaking both English and French to each other. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they, they've actually, a Montreal office is part of the game. I think it's Grand <laughs> Theft Auto. It's one of the, the recent Ubisoft games. So, I mean, they, they do put it in to some extent. We've looked at the question of, to some extent, what's working, what isn't. We've looked at the question of where are we going? Uh, what, what are the policy implications of what we've been saying. Um, if you're concerned about uh, over-the-top services, um, 
how do we go about changing them and what can the CRTC do, uh, should it do anything uh, to try to accommodate or uh, reduce the negative effects of over-the-top services. Well, uh, in general, I feel that the CRTC's role is to regulate or, you know, to make sure that the industry is working in a certain way. So if, if we do have uh, policies that we do have now for, uh, you know, broadcasters have to spend a certain amount, then they have to look at all these new providers in the same way, uh, both uh, culturally, um, financially, in order to employ more Canadians, uh, and culturally, of course, uh, so we can tell our stories. Whether they're set here or not, our stories can be set wherever, but, you know, they are our own. So um, that's where I, I, I would hope that the CRTC could continue um, looking at it that way. Does everybody agree with that? You mean is Canadian content important, or is it possible in the, uh, in the Ubisoft world? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> I know it's important. Whether it's possible in a, in a world of Grand Theft Auto, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering how a regulator or anybody could tell Ubisoft uh, that they should be, you know, showing uh, something set in Canada. They would, I'm sure, laugh. But yet they're located in Montreal. Right. They did it because, you know, it was part of their creativity so that you know, it, it's not that the CRTC has to tell the creators what to, what to put into their stories, but just allow us to tell stories, allow mm -hmm. us to be employed and to continue creating and market, market our movies and um, around the world and here in town, you know, and in the mm -hmm. country and, and the TV stations as well. Like, you know, when there's great movies, you know, that aren't marketed properly and no one sees them, then it, it, it seems like... Um, yeah, let's not forget that the, the purpose of the Broadcasting Act uh, and the authority that the Broadcasting Act gives to the CRTC is to regulate broadcasting. Now, to what extent are games broadcasting? Um, broadcasting has to do with, uh, in fact, providing a service generally to a general population. Uh, so to the extent that it comes over, that the games are provided over the internet, then we could say that, yes, they're, they're a, that's a broadcasting undertaking. Um, although it's exempted from regulation, it, it's arguably a broadcasting activity, just like all of, the, uh, all of the activities over the internet are broadcasting activities, as long as they're not in script, and as long as they're not, I'm not talking about email, but I'm talking about anything that's audiovisual is potentially uh, regulatable by the CRTC according to the definition of broadcasting. This hasn't been tested in the courts, but uh, it appears to be the case, and I think, I think the CRTC uh, accepts that. What they've done is to exempt certain types of services that they feel at this time they do not wish to, to regulate. Now, does, do, do, uh, do, do, do uh, Ubisoft games fit into the category of broadcasting? Up until this discussion, I never thought so. Um, I always, I was thinking, you know, you, we're thrilled to have Ubisoft and Warner Games and Eidos and all those game companies um, here in Montreal and employing actor members and other and investing in the uh, uh, in the community. But I, I didn't think of it as broadcast. Just like if all of your TV content was. Um, seen when you purchase a DVD and put it in your um, in, the, in the machine. It's not. It's broadcast over the air or through cable or something like that. But you're right. Uh, Ubisoft particularly, uh, a lot of their content, while you can buy the game at uh, the Future Shop or wherever, um, a lot of the content can come through your cable or through uh, some broadcasting. That's, I think that's a very interesting and creative way of looking at it. I also hate to be a um, geek about the whole thing, but Grand Theft Auto wasn't Ubisoft. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was not produced here. Uh, uh, you might, 
Uh, sorry? No, no, and Ubisoft is not headquartered here. It's headquartered in Paris. Yeah, yeah their biggest studio <coughs> is uh, here in Montreal, and they also have one in Quebec City, but uh, uh, that's true. Uh, but you might have been thinking of Assassin's Creed. That's it. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Was there another? Uh, I was just yeah. wanted to know, how are we defining Canadian content? Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just thinking about this past year's uh, Amazing Race Canada, which is essentially the American template brought here to Canada, but I'm sure it is falling in the category of Canadian content for CTV. And I was just wondering, do we really consider that Canadian content or, or not? Why so, not? Well, I'm just wondering how much money CTV paid for the rights to take that template. Why couldn't they create their own reality programming themselves? Why did they have to buy that? That's all I'm, I'm wondering about. Well, there is a formal definition of, of a Canadian program, and of course it requires a minimum of six points, uh, unless it's a co-venture, and uh, at least 75% uh, of the spending has to be on, on Canadian elements, and there has to be a writer or a director, uh, normally a Canadian writer or a director. But so there's a, there's a formal definition of a Canadian program, and I think that's the definition that we're operating under. Uh, in this discussion. I think Amazing Race is a very interesting issue because leaving aside the question of um, templates and you know uh, models that are like um, uh, Dragon's Den is a British model for example but it's very popular in Canada and the, and the people that are on it, Idiot O'Leary and the others, uh, are, are, have uh, attracted uh, followings uh, amongst Canadians so it's a very interesting thing. The Amazing Race template is fascinating because CTV, I think, broke all kinds of audience records, over three million or something like that. And so it showed Canadians want to see themselves, even if it's these uh, anonymous, nondescript people who are running across the country, at least Canadians now know which country they're running across, you know, <laughs> which is their country. And therefore, they're saying, oh, wow, we want to see this. So every so often, by accident, and despite ourselves, we seem to accidentally bump into the fact that we are showing ourselves to ourselves. And when that happens, whether it's Kevin Sullivan's program many years ago, or whether it's Dragon's Den, or whether it's this, uh, we find out that there is an underlying desire that I think too many broadcasters don't actually believe exists, which is that Canadians really do want to see themselves. And they get caught up in uh, the financial thing, which is we cannot show uh, Canada in any program because then the Americans won't buy it and then we won't have a financial model and yet you know does anyone test it and say okay Americans or whatever network uh, here it is it's really great tremendous audience in Canada do you want to buy it even though it's set in Toronto and therefore it's off the edge of the world and no one knows where it is and all the rest of it so now I find it very strange a lot of Toronto programs show the CN Tower which everyone knows exists somewhere, um, but they never mention it. Or they show police cars that say police, but they don't mention Toronto on it. It's Metro Police or something of the sort. I don't know why I'm discussing this. I won't make a you bad... Can't, you, uh, can't, you can't say Toronto Police. I won't make a bad Rob Ford joke at this point. <laughs> <laughs> was there, was there um, an issue here? Yeah, I was just thinking back to... Um, let me think of that thought, because you were talking about... Uh, media, what defines media, um, the definition in French is diffusion. And that diffusion, that, that is, I think we have to appreciate uh, that Netflix and these have come up with some very cool business models. And that's entrepreneuring. That's part one. So I think, you know, it's an interesting definition to say diffusion over the top and, and it would make sense for the CRTC to look into that. But I have a more basic question, which is, do you, in your capacities and so on, find that the CRTC runs scared of broadcasters? You're here to answer the questions. I'm just cutting to the no. quick on this, because okay. you look at some of the, occasionally a chairman will come along and, you know, but I'm just wondering, what is the careful? If they really are mandated to demonstrate that they are behind Canadian content and know the problems. I mean, this forum, this can't be any new news to anybody who mm -hmm. is watching. Um, 
we're being broadcast live, by the way, across the world. And <laughs> no, I, nobody, <laughs> it just really comes down to, do they really, uh, are they committed to looking at that issue at core, or are they really on the side, not that it's wrong, but just in the balance of business to stimulate an industry? We can go back and look at all of the companies that were built on telefilm money that then went public, having been funded to a third of the telefilm budget, not to mention any companies in particular, and then had access to the money once they were public, dipping into the same pot that the Indies were doing. We have an interesting system that when you look at from the outside, when I go to the States and stuff, they still often, less so now, consider Canada a bank. I mean, CAA said to me, so uh, what can we bank in Canada? You know, you just have to, you know, shake them. It's changing in perception because of our exports, and that's coming along. But it's an interesting thing to say that if we're committed to it, and there's a regulatory body which is unique, you don't have such in the U.S. as such, well, no, what is they, there? They do have a regulatory no, body. No, but in terms of, it's a different model, business model. They don't get the subsidizing and so on. But what is the commitment to the Canadian creative production industry as an industry as opposed to the broadcasting industry? There's two industries here. And the independent production community generates an enormous amount of, of opportunities and work and so on, pays a lot of taxes. But on balance, it seems very weighted to the business side, the telcos, the amalgamation, consolidation, etc. And that's okay. But at the same time, even on the R&D question I was proposing earlier, there's an imbalance. So does it have the teeth even you know, it's just, I think, a fair question to ask because Absolutely. I think what we're discussing and I, here. I, I open, uh, I'd like I'm, to I'm just hear. curious from your experience, if you step back as a um, no conflict of interest guy and look at it, what would you say their commitment would be? Well, I, I, I'm not, I don't want to become uh, well, an, a, a participant. Too. Can nice. we put this question out to, sure. to everybody? I will say that there are a number of elements that uh, in, in responding to your question, which are the Broadcasting Act, mm -hmm. which is a legal document, the way in which CRTC commissioners are named by the Government of Canada, and the political pressure that comes on, obviously, on government and uh, governments to make nominations, um, and the fact that the CRTC wants a viable industry. It doesn't want to be licensing people to fail. So it's concerned, and once it does license people, it tends to defend them because it wants to those entities to work uh, as much as possible. Um, so I can throw the those uh, three elements into the mix, but uh, what, do you, what do you people think? Yeah, I mean, I'm no expert, but it seemed to me in the past that whenever it came to uh, qualifying what was content, the CRTC was only too happy to say, okay, reality programming is Canadian content, and therefore uh, we can push back a bit on, on, on fiction and literature and all the rest. So I, I mean, I could be wrong, but it seemed to me that the CRTC generally backs off and the other thing, it seems to me that the parameters of this, this discussion are really commercial television. We're not dealing here with the CBC and other th We could very well. It, uh -huh. We're talking about television and not just, yeah. so the CBC and educational broadcasters, you're right, have not really come into the picture so far. But there's no reason why we can't uh, talk about them. That's just my general impression, and, and I, 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 I remember all those discussions came up when reality TV was, was taking off and all the rest. and. I don't know, it always felt that the, the CRTC was just backing off. Well, I remember when uh, the CBC was told, I don't know, when, this was quite a few years ago, where they used to show all this American programming during prime time, and then they had to switch and show mainly Canadian programming. And what a success that has become with shows like Heartland and Dragon's Den and all, all these shows that show that you know people want to see good programming, good stories set in Saskatchewan, but that's CTV, um, but, you know, all those shows. So um, that worked. So, um, so I think that, you know, we can go to the other broadcasters and who are making lots of money because they own all these other different things and they always plead poverty, but they make billions of dollars a year in profit. Kerwin. Um, 
The CRTC, it seems to me, are always fighting an internal conflict between the industrial system and the cultural system. And the theory is they both work together. But the problem is that the Broadcasting Act exists not as an industrial act, but as a cultural act. And the rationale for the CBC, the rationale for telefilm, the rationale for the tax credit, the rationale for all the public supports, the Canadian content rules, everything is cultural. If it were simply a matter of industrial support, then maybe the production industry would do as well as Bombardier, I don't know. But the point is that it's only because uh, over the years we say we want to have these things for, as a cultural uh, value in the public interest that there has been the political support to provide the billions and billions and billions of dollars of production money uh, to help make these things possible. If it were only an industrial objective or rationale, then it would be a question of let the market decide, and I think you'd very quickly have the market deciding it wants to work in Los Angeles, because uh, it doesn't have to travel as far. And then we would get, like we had with uh, movies back in the 20th century, uh, Hollywood was the center, uh, and we had our exhibitors, and we had our distributors, and they had their producers, and Canadians went to the movie theater to see American products pretty much only, because it was really an industrial uh, free market system. And if we want an industrial free market television system, then we can look to the movie theater business as our model, which is we won't have any Canadian content, and the Canadians that produce that stuff will all be living in Los Angeles. To the degree we don't want that, then we have to accept the cultural rationale. But there has to be a balance, because a cultural rationale without an industrial or commercial uh, foundation isn't going to work either. So we, we have to figure out how these two things are going to work together. And, and it's it been an age-old problem. And it hasn't, to my knowledge, never been resolved. And I'm sure that Blay will be able to resolve it. Any other comments? John? Well, again, going back to RMD, it seems to me, and again, I'm a bit out of the loop, but it seems to me that the CRTC should facilitate anything it can to promote pilots. I mean, let's face it, American TV, they knock off an, a, a, any number of pilots, and, and one out of ten will work. But I don't think that, that our networks have the means or necessarily even the interest to do that, because until you've done a pilot, you can't really see what's going to happen. And I think that's the basis of so much of the successful programs. And we've had many. North of 60 was tremendously successful, very Canadian. We had the one of the Mountie, you know, the, the one I'm talking about. The, uh, south, yeah, yeah, south of whatever it was. I mean, <laughs> we've done really good stuff, but it's never replicated. And I always had this kind of hunch that it's because there's no R&D money for pilots. I mean, these producers do these great shows, and then they disappear. Or many do. And uh, I, I, I think that has to be looked at. As a producer, I will say uh, I would much rather spend time you know, with research and development, working with writers, doing three to four scripts, and then getting a green light. If I have to do uh, a pilot, I'd sort of like shoot me, because it's so much work. Uh, to get a, to get it up, to do the casting, to do the locations, to do the set, to do everything, and there's never enough money to do the pilots, and it's just not ever really worthwhile. But but I'm not saying that. But I have to agree with Mark. It's the research and development. If you have that time to really work on the scripts and to find the writers and to do some of the pre-casting and all of that, and then go to be greenlit, that would be better. What I'm saying is, is that the pilot only comes after the process you're talking about, and that there probably are a number of uh, th those, um, uh, not experiments, but a number of those processes that go on and then should have a pilot or should have the means to have a pilot and don't. That's what I, that's what I mean. I mean, Netflix uh, greenlit House of Card without a pilot because um, they have all the big data. You don't really need a pilot nowadays, as long as you have the big data, so you can just look at it and see what people want kind of thing, and just write good script and have the star system and whatnot, of course. But um, I, I guess I'm 
disagreeing with you a bit yeah, about I, the pilot. I don't think we're talking about the same thing. I, I, to launch a series, you basically need a pilot because you need, again, to continue the, 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 the process that, that Judy is talking about. There's fine tuning all the way along, you know? And I've worked on a lot, and a lot of tweaking and, and, and you know, picking out of which characters you're going to go with and all the rest. And a lot of that, the, the pilot is, is, is like the, the, the field trip in, in, into the reality, but that only comes after a lot of research and everything. But I don't think what I'm saying is we don't have the means to do what, say, the American networks do in throwing off after re all the, 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 the preparatory work. It's, it's, they shoot pilots, and I've worked on a lot of these things, and I, you hear the producers talking, and a lot of it ha has to do with innovation, which is what they're looking at. They're letting it play itself a bit, you know? Whereas everything in Canada seems, because we're so, we don't have the means where everything is, is like predetermined, and it's this and that and the other thing, and nothing really breathes and takes off. Okay, I'd like to come back to the third um, general theme that I had mentioned before, and that is the, the issue of the CRTC and what can the CRTC do to improve the system, or should it dismantle the system? I guess the big question is, really, should the current system be dismantled in some ways or, or reduced in size and importance? Should the CRTC become less of a player in the Canadian broadcasting system and let things go? Or should it become more active? And if it should become more active, in what ways should it be, should it be uh, more active? Uh, no, they shouldn't dismantle it. <laughs> um, let's look at an, uh, an example. Um, and for, for me, it's all about the, the spending requirement. Broadcasters will not spend on Canadian production unless they have to. We saw in the 99 uh, TV policy a lot of the spending guts were taken out of uh, television policy and the number of Canadian uh, TV series plummeted. In the last couple of years, some of those spending requirements, especially for the PNI, is, you know, there's been something put back in and there's been somewhat of a take. I mean, it's still in early since, the, uh, since those changes. Um, I think the CRTC has to keep an eye on that. If we want, you know, the Broadcast Act, I believe, I could be wrong, says something like, broadcasters, you could use the public airwaves, but you have to invest in Canadian production. If that's the trade-off, then the CRTC that regulates and operationalizes that Broadcasting Act uh, has, to, has to keep their eye on that and finding out ways to get broadcasters who are using our, uh, our airwaves to invest in uh, local production for cultural reasons, for employment reasons, for economic reasons, for, for all of those reasons. And that brings us back to the over the tops and uh, how things are going and what a lot of people have said about how, you know, it's called new media for a reason. There's all these new business models uh, that, <laughs> that are coming out and, and the, the broadcaster has to keep an eye on, on that. And I don't have, they're, they're not easy answers. And the easy, if there was an easy answer that was appropriate now, it might change in two or three years. Maybe what we should be looking at is shorter windows for uh, broadcast regulation because the, um, I mean, this is just off the top of my head, so, uh, I don't, be, because the business models are changing so much with, uh, with uh, digital media. And, I mean, and, this, and I, what should the CRTC be saying to programming and distribution undertakings that are complaining about the over-the-top services and saying it's, the system is unfair, the current system is unfair, uh, we're regulated, we're obliged to perform in certain ways, and they're not. They should be looking. I, I, I agree with what you were saying, that it's tricky, that there's no obvious solution. They have to regulate the over-the-tops. They have to find ways. If these companies are getting money from the Canadian system, a broadcast system, they are broadcasting through, through cables, through whatever, into, uh, into Canada, and Canadians are spending money on it, there has to be a way of capturing some of that and reinvesting it in Canadian production. Um, and, it, I mean, it'll take creativity to find it. But I, okay. I, Anybody else? Yeah, I, th I totally agree. I agree with Gary. And I'm sure the over-the-tops, I'm sure they're going to kick and scream and there'll be legal battles and everything else. But at the end of the day, 
they're going to want to make their $182 million, $200 million that they're getting out of Canada. So if that means they have to put in, you know, a small percentage, I'm sure at the end of the day they're going to continue doing that. And I just see them getting, you know, bigger and bigger and making more money. Back at the back. I, I do think that the key is to regulate the over-the-tops because if you follow the argument of the broadcaster, say you're not going to regulate over-the-tops, then it really is unfair to the broadcasters to have them be regulated. And then they make less Canadian content, and then what are they doing? I already get ABC, CBS, NBC. I don't need a Canadian network to show me the good wife. If they're not creating something, why are they existing when I can just get the signal elsewhere? I mean, the point of a Canadian, uh, the point of a network is to create content or curate content. And, you know, that the, the whole business model of a network hinges on the decisions here. Uh, aren't the OTTs using the Canadian public airways? They're At using some point in their distribution chain. Well, they must be uh, if they're coming over the internet. I mean, in my understanding of Netflix, I don't have Netflix at home, but I understand that it comes over the internet. Yeah. And the internet is basically, arguably, much of what's on the internet is arguably a broadcasting activity and therefore potentially regulatable by the CRTC. If, if they cross the airwaves at some point, uh, then they are subject to uh, Canadian regulation. Well, they don't even have to cross the airwaves. When something comes down, the c comes uh, in by, through cable, it's not, it's not on the airwaves. If there is a, um, a wireless connection at some point in the system, all they have to do is, I, I guess, cross your living room in the air, and then they are subject to uh, uh, the Canadian No, they have to be, well, they have to be generally available. They have to be generally, broadcasting, part of the definition of broadcasting implies that something is generally available. So if you, for instance, within Concordia, uh, set up a small uh, system within the, within the confines of Concordia, it's not necessarily regulatable. If it's, or if you run up one wires into a series of rooms, and broad and and uh, re uh, di um, re diffuse uh, the uh, the uh, s certain material. That's not a broadcasting I, activity. I, I think it's undeniable that that Netflix, to use them as an example, uh, sh are subject to Canadian regulation when they are in Canada. And if the CRTC neglects to regulate them, then the CRTC is at fault. And we don't want to have a lowering of standards. Uh, by saying, uh, if you don't re regulate Netflix, then you can't regulate Bell and Shaw, and then if you can't regulate them, you can't regulate somebody else, and you have a, a race to the bottom. I, I don't think that's in the public interest. Right, but again, Bell and Shaw have, have a physical presence in Canada, whereas Netflix doesn't, and that poses a problem, it seems to me. There's no Netflix Canada option? Uh, is, f is there? I don't know, but they don't have to have one. Uh, presumably, they could... <laughs> They could uh, they could operate entirely f offshore, presumably. Um, I have a question more than an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, say if you sign up for Hulu or Netflix in the states, you can access Netflix in the state. And when you come over, you're still using the same password and name and everything, but you paid in the states. So what is that considered? Under? That's considered the gray market. Mm. Okay. That's considered, and Hulu is not actually available in Canada, as far as I understand. If you mask your IP, you can get it. Oh, you can. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's cheating. Thank you. <laughs> about, so, of course, we would never do such <laughs> About Netflix, and to regulate Netflix, we need to be careful, because Netflix is a very good provider for Canadian content outside mm -hmm. Canada. We have some kind of a threat here. If we start regulating Netflix, maybe the Cana they will pull the plug for any Canadian content, and the exportation of our content will be gone. It's, it's a threat here that mm -hmm. maybe we need to be careful with. They, they actually provide yeah. different contents for U.S. Netflix and Canadian Netflix. So. Yeah, I think there's one part of the equation that we talk about the CRTC, but in its relationship, I, I, I think if the CRTC really wants to create this cultural base and this industrial balance that uh, the gentleman was talking about, um, that the creative industries like science, technology, and those things that are subsidized, however the rules protect or f uh, funnel cash 
I'm coming back to the R&D here. I have great affinity and respect for the creative community here, like any science community technology. There is a tremendous export opportunity within this country. And if it fed the creative producers and writers and those people whose job it is to create consumable, exciting, inspirational product, and the broadcasters started to get the benefit of this because these writers and producers and people and the directors and so on are subsidized, like farming, like science and technology, because it is a subsidized thing. And we have to be because of the size. It's just a fact, 30 million versus hundreds of millions. Let's be real about it. Let's invest in that talent and everybody wins because you have to put faith in that industry and to really subsidize the, the genius that is here. And we have proven it time and time again that products well made will export. The Gannon Green Gables is one example, but I think the assumption is has to be Canadian. It has to be well made and compelling stories in film and television and media, and new media. There's a great deal of investment in those high-tech industries, in the gaming industry and others where they are subsidized heavily by government. And likewise, if this money could be however done, the CRTC could be tremendously instrumental in channeling the money back in the R&D to these creative communities. And I'm convinced with enough subsidies, and I've seen it time and again, but if it was upped tremendously, you would have a business where the broadcasters would get product that they could actually sell to advertisers it would compete successfully against it because there's a great export of Canadian talent to the U.S. There are, as we know in drama, we go and we'll find the writing rooms are in L.A. Expats getting Canadian content tax money. So it could be an industry if it was fed. And we have the potential in this country. We demonstrated through comedy. The, uh, if you line up the quality of work and the talent, the reason the broadcast is part of it, and I've been the broadcaster too for a while at Global and helped got them on the rails. If you step back and you take a look at things, you realize that there's very little choice for broadcasters. They can only subsidize a few things. If they had a choice, they would get the inspira inspired, motivated, out of the box thinking that Channel 4 does. The, the British model is an excellent example. They do things out there that are amazing. We have that same talent here. So I think it comes down to that R&D. I mean, it's a theme I presented at the beginning, and I believe it. And anything that would feed that, the broadcasters would, would benefit. The writers would benefit. You'd have that balance. John? Yeah, my impression, I'm sure it's a bit jaded, is that Canadians don't, aren't really good at getting the big picture. And I sincerely think that the CRTC has guaranteed us jobs through forcing broadcasters to do Canadian content. Um, but they haven't done a lot to develop the industry. And it seems to me that the real tug of war with the broadcasters is that the idea that the low common denominator is how you make money. And we've never gone to the, been able to convince them that actually it's quality that can also make you money. And that what Canada has never been able to do is to come up with something like CBC type material, Coronation Street, or that 25 year running German detective series called Derek. And it just seems to me that um, we have the talent and somewhere it's not really working and we have these gatekeepers and um, I don't know, I, I would love to have a, a, I would be spellbound I think to have a forum of all the producers in Canada who have done successful shows like North of 60 and you name them all, get them all into a room and, and see and let them speak. I don't think we do the kind of research that it takes to put us up there. Hi, my name is Chico, I'm the coordinator of uh, Concordia University Television, so we're here to represent the uh, community sector somehow, or okay. as creators, yeah. independent creators. And um, one thing is, we're under the assumption that technology is not changing, like TV and, okay, uh, rephrasing, TV and computers are a different thing, whereas I don't have a TV for 10 years now, and I won't ever buy a TV until a TV is a computer. So I'm, gonna, I, I'm the person that I know that consumes the most TV and film that I know, and I don't own a TV. <laughs> so. When I create my, my own productions or when I work in production, I have that in mind, that people are not consuming in a, in a television medium. So uh, about uh, Netflix and uh, Amazons and Hulus and everything, I just think that 
internationally something is going to happen and they're going to force all these uh, companies to act and to give some kind of percentage to the national production and don't go on the assumption that the Canadian content is consumed. Uh, it's presented in Netflix uh, outside Canada because it's not just the big ones who have uh, a lot of hits. So if we, uh, any of us, create a, a production that is watched or that is kind of successful in the Canadian Netflix, it doesn't assure that it's going to be. Th that I don't think it's, uh, it's very well thought because it could be a way to give back to the community, to the country, saying that we're uh, selling the, the content elsewhere. But uh, that's the thing. I, I just didn't say anything because I enjoyed listening. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. There's no need for regulation? No, no, I say there is need for regulation for sure. But uh, I think for, in the case of Netflix, that is the biggest panic right now. It's going to be international because uh, Canada is complaining. Even the states are complaining. Portugal is complaining. Britain is complaining. Everybody is complaining. So one day every CRTC are, uh, from all around the world are going to get together and say we, we have to just force them to, to pay. Because it doesn't make sense. We all know. We create and we say. We create and we consume and we say it doesn't make sense. So it's just a matter, even when they are offering us a good deal, we say, oh, don't forget about the little ones. And so I, it's I have another question. As a Concordia student, I'm not how a student. Do, sorry? I'm not a student, but it's fine. As a Concordia person who's not a student, <laughs> <laughs> how do you see your future? Or, or do you see your, I assume you see your future doing media of whatever kind. Uh, do you feel you're going to be staying in uh, Montreal, or are you? Uh, for sure, I came from Portugal. So in Portugal, there's no industry; it's even worse. <laughs> if we complain here in Portugal, forget it. <laughs> uh, and uh, yes, I want to stay here for sure because of the multicultural cultural uh, environment that we're in. Uh, but I think, as an outsider, one of the worst things that I see is that Canadians compare themselves to 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 the Americans instead of thinking. There is other models like the the British, like with Luther and Skins and and uh, Doctor Who and uh, all programs that were bought by Americans. So therefore, the Americans invested them to produce more, even if they reproduced the same show in American. And you have both like Skins uh, playing uh, back to back. So uh, the future is is really unclear, and that's why we're here. And we're here to help out the next generations to to try to, to be fair and not be eaten by the big ones. What about the guy next to you? Do you know him? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know him. I'm just, I'm just here to listen. I'm, I'm not f particularly familiar with what all of the CRTC doing, so I'm more here for an educational purposes than to offer my, my comments. And Do you I, watch television? Uh, not really, no. You, you have a computer? I do have a computer. What do you do with your computer? Well, you know. What everyone else does with computers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have Netflix and video games and things of that sort. So is there a future in Canada for uh, uh, people making stuff? Well, I mean, everyone can, is, can get to continuously make stuff no matter, no matter what, right? Even, even if there's no money in it, people are going to continue to do it. So. And where do you see your future? <laughs> Here, somewhere else? Uh, you know, you, you, go, you go where the money takes you. <laughs> so you're leaving for Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> I would rather stay here than Toronto. It's based on, you know, the cultural diversity and the, you know, the experiences I have had here. You know, I mean, like she said, you know, whitewash stuff. Yep. Not, the, not my forte. <laughs> okay. Um, did you have a, a yeah, uh, comment? Yeah, I just hope the, the content those guys watch is uh, legal. Uh, because, uh, as you know, the, the Canadian government uh, already uh, made a legislation on piracy. Piracy was a threat to any content. Um, so watching on legal sources on the internet is the first step of many steps, I think. But uh, let me throw a little rock in the pound here. I think. Thank you for the exercise in regard of CRTC, but uh, I will. I think I will agree with the research and development, and maybe you, even more, because one of the reason we're we're here, the base of it is the Canadian content. 
I'm French Canadian and we have a French Canadian content on TV and the importance of that content is the base, the screenwriter, you know, the story, the Canadian story or the French Canadian story. So at the source, it's the story you brought us here. Uh, is the CRTC doing his stuff and doing all the legislation will correct that? Not sure if the stories are not there. So this is why you need development to develop stories and be able to see ourselves on the screen. So I think we made a very good exercise, but basically we need to go back at the source and ask for more Canadian stories. And maybe this is why we need to uh, do some legislation to regulate internet and bring some money back into the Canadian content. But um, I think there's many things here and it's not, I, I think the CRTC is not the only uh, source to solve all those issues. And uh, I think this is what I, I'd like to recap. Well, thank you for your emphasis on storytelling. That was, in fact, the, the guts of uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg's keynote address at MIPCOM this year, was the story is where it's at, storytelling is where it's at. Yeah. And uh, he, that's why he believes in conventional television, why he's moving DreamWorks animation increasingly into, te into television. Uh, because he feels there is a future for it, but on that basis. Yeah. And let's put a hand yeah. on TV reality shows. Yeah. Over. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want it anymore. Was there another comment here? Yeah, just to say that there are lots of storytellers that go into telling stories on television and in movies, and those include the actors and mm. as well as the writers. And so we need to do the research and development on that side as well so that performers across the country can be hired, not just in Toronto, not just in Vancouver, but in Montreal, Halifax, and Calgary, everywhere. Okay. Was there a comment at the back? Uh, no, but I'll make one. No, um, okay, <laughs> please. You know, I was just thinking about all the outrage when Argo came out, and people were saying that was a Canadian story, and the Americans stole their Canadian story. If we can't make our films here, everything gets Americanized or it gets changed for an international audience. You know, people say they don't want to watch Canadian TV, but the day they see Anne of Green Gables set in Connecticut, it'll be too late, and you can't go backwards. And I think that's what we're fighting for here, is the ability to tell stories here. All right. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Yes. Like, yes. I'm, I'm from uh, Concordia, too. Uh, well, what, uh, what we are, you know, there's students, there's members, we're all independent. We're making small little video clips. And th this is what we're about. We want to produce small clips or, or big clips. But the difference here is we want somebody to pay for it. But I think it's more important that it's universal that people can produce you know, their own media, whether it's uh, video, film, music. And it's like, oh, we're special. We want to get paid. Well, that's, that's one model. But you know, I just want to make videos, I want everybody to do that, and we do that through YouTube. That costs mm -hmm. nothing. You know, so it's like, yeah, we're special. Yeah, I'd like to be special too. But there I, are two streams, and I, mean, th I think we have to recognize this. The digital media have, have permitted the creation of a second stream, which is basically user-generated material. And that's all, that's wonderful. But there's also professionally generated material that can garner large audiences through the broadcasting system. And I think those are two different streams to some extent. There's some overlap, but they're, they're two different streams. Anybody else? Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.